Hello and welcome back to Community Bible Study and this year's study of the book of Job, reputed to be maybe the oldest book of the Bible. Kind of interesting. Last year we studied the most recent book of the Bible and this year we're studying the oldest book of the Bible. Thanks for joining us. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you here. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, it is an honor to be here. It's a privilege and an honor to be in your word. We, we think of our friend Job, who doesn't have any of the Bible as he's going through these trials and tribulations. Doesn't have any in the Old Testament, doesn't have any in the New Testament. And yet he has... Yet he has an unwavering, seemingly, faith in, in you. Father, we've got a lot to learn, um, especially from this man Job and from your word. So, so we ask, Father, that you be the speaker, that you, that you superintend your will over all the words that are said, and you open our minds and our hearts to better understand you. And grow closer to you. We pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I think I said last week, great poet Alfred Lord Tennyson said, Job is the greatest poem of ancient or modern times. <laughs> I wonder if he skipped over chapter three. I, I mean... Raise your hand if this is your favorite chapter in the Bible, you know. Do you, do you have do you have verses in chapter 3 on your mirror and your cards of memorizing verses? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to commit chapter 3 of Job to memory. <laughs> we, we began our story about about Job. God begins our story in the land of Uz or the land of Uz. Uh, there, there lived a man whose name was Job. The man was blameless and upright. Upright, he feared God and shunned evil. He was complete spiritually, lacking nothing in spiritual maturity. And yet, and yet, God saw fit to to have him be tested. This this test of wills. This cosmic battle uh, between God and Satan and and God allows Satan to test Job and he and he tests him drastically he tests him in in two different tests a, a test of of his possessions and his stuff and a, and a test of his person God allows Satan to to take away all of Job's wealth to take away all of his family, all of his possessions, and all of his people. And, and then God allows Job, if that's not enough, to, to afflict Job's person, his body, with sores, with boils, with, with AIDS, leprosy, cancer, what, whatever it was. It was really, really bad. And in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. What a guy. But Job, as we, as we move on in our story, we, we find Job uh, sitting on a dung heap out, out in the, the trash, the, the garbage heap with Sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head, took a piece of broken pottery, scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. Did, did such a good job of scraping himself. And he was unrecognizable. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar, heard about all the troubles that had come upon Job, they, they set out from their homes far away. And met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. 
when they saw him from a distance, Job was so unrecognizable because of, of all of his sores. They, they began to weep aloud. I sat on the ground with him for seven days, seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. But we know that's not all, don't we? Um, these guys came to sympathize and to comfort. But their sympathy and their comfort quickly turns to blame and shame. And it turns to condemnation and judgment. And it turns to legalism and, and advice. Good advice? Maybe some would think so. Reminds me of the the story of the men who had just finished playing golf and they were in the locker room getting dressed and they were all there together in the locker room and there was a cell phone lying on the bench and, and it rang and one of the men picked it up and he said, hello, and, and he put it on speaker uh, and, and the woman on the other end said, honey, hi, is that you? Are you still at the club? And the man answered, yes, I sure am. And she said, hey, um, I've got a request from you. Um, I'm at the mall, and and there's this gorgeous leather coat. It's only two thousand dollars. Is it okay if I get it? The man responds, "Sure, it's okay with me." And then and then the woman says, "And by the way, on my way home, I'd like to go by the Lexus dealer. I I, I see that that they've got a, the brand new Lexuses have, have come into town, and and they're they're on the showroom floor and." And I'd really like to get that, that high-end Lexus. And the man says, well, well how much is it? And she says, I, I think I can get it for $90,000. The man says, sure, if that's what you want. And then she says, oh, and I forgot to tell you, um, our realtor in, in Vail, Colorado called and said that the condo we've been looking at has dropped from price. It's dropped from a million dollars to $980,000. What do you think? Man says, well, if, if you really want it, go ahead. And the woman just laughs with glee and says, thank you, honey, I love you, bye-bye. And the man says, bye. And he turns off the phone and he looks around at all the guys. He says, does anybody know whose phone this is? Sometimes you get good advice, sometimes you get bad advice. We said that the book of Job is about tests of faith. Last week we saw that Job's faith was tested by Satan. And this week we see that Job's faith is tested by false friends, part one. In, in chapters 3 through 14, is we find the, the first of three cycles of debate and argument between Job and his friends. These cycles follow a pattern. Uh, first of all, Eliphaz speaks. I'm going to call him Ellie. And then Job replies. Then Bildad speaks. And I'm going to call him Billy. <laughs> and Job replies. And then Zophar speaks. I'm going to call him Zoe. And Job responds. So we'll look first at what? And that's Job arguing, debating with his friends. Then we'll ask, so what? And we'll look and see if there are any wise lessons for us to learn. Then we'll ask, now what? Is there any good advice that we can glean from these chapters? I think so. What I really want us to learn from these chapters, there are a lot of good lessons, but the one that strikes me at home says, you know, we have hope in God. I think that's the central idea for me in these chapters. We have hope in God. So first, first let's look at Job's opening argument. After all this that happened to Job in chapters 1 and 2, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, may the day of my birth perish. And the night it was said a boy is born, that day may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine upon it. Why didn't I perish at birth? Why didn't I die as I came out of the womb? Why was I not hidden in the ground as a stillborn child? 
what I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. Poor Job. Job moves from humble submission to, to despair over what has happened to him. Job says, I wish I hadn't been born. He says, if I were born, I wish I had died at birth. And if I'm going to live at birth, I, I wish that I could die right now. I don't like what's going on. I'm disappointed with life. I'm disappointed with God. Nothing's going right with my wife, with my life. Job's complaints follow a pattern from here through chapter 31. We will see over and over in these three cycles repeated themes. We see Job first expresses disappointment in his friends. Then he declares God's greatness. Then he expresses disillusionment with God's ways. And fourth, he expresses despair with life or even desire for death. And fifth, he expresses desire for vindication with God. And Job's friends, we put that word in quote, their arguments, their advice to Job contains some elements of truth. Let's be honest about that. And, and, and some are even scriptural, but they evolve into secular viewpoints. There's so many chapters to cover here. I'm going to look at the big picture. Ellie, Ellie starts out with respect and restraint in his responses to Job. He even says that God is transcendent. But then he says, but let's be sure, God punishes the wicked. God performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, fathomed miracles that cannot be counted. He bestows rain upon the earth. The lowly he sits on high. He thwarts the plans of the crafty. He catches the wise in their craftiness. Darkness comes upon the worldly wise in daytime. At noon they grope as in the night. That's what Eliphaz has to say. Billy, Billy is more direct. He says, God is just and great, but make no mistake, he judges the sinner. He judges all sinners. Billy says, does God pervert justice? No way. Does the Almighty pervert what is right? Not, not a chance. While still growing and uncut, the wicked wither more quickly than grass. Such is the destiny of all who forget God. So perishes the hope of the godless. Zoe. Zoe, probably the youngest of the three. He's more blunt. He's in fact brutal. He says God cannot be questioned. God may even be immerciful to the sinner. So he says, Job, you say to God, my beliefs are flawless, and I am pure in your sight. Ah. Oh, how I wish that God would speak, that he would open up his lips against you to disclose to you the secrets of sound wisdom. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They're higher even than the heavens. Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. Job, you will lie down with no one to make you afraid, and many will count on your favor if you repent. But the eyes of the wicked will fail, and escape will elude them. Their hope will become a dying grasp. But while, while some of their counsel is biblical, like I said, Ellie is somewhat of a mystic. 
His opinions are based on experience. Over and over, he says, I have seen or I have observed this or that. And Billy, Billy's a legalist. His opinions are based on tradition. He says, check out your ancestors. Talk to the previous generations, Job. Zoe is a dogmatist. His opinions are based on his own assumptions. This is what I think God would say. This is what I think is on God's mind. And all three of them, all three of them say that people get what they deserve. Job, you brought this on yourself. They reiterate the theme that people get what they deserve. That God rewards the righteous and punch it, punishes the sinner. Therefore, since all suffering is for sin, and therefore since you are suffering, Job, you must be a sinner. You must be a sinner. I don't care what you say, Job. You must be a sinner. But let me back up just a minute. At this point, let's not be too hard on Ellie and Billy and Zoe. When they heard that Job was in trouble, they went to their hurting friend with, at first at least, a good motive, a motive to sympathize and empathize and comfort their hurting friend. At least we can say about these guys is that they showed up. But the longer they stayed, the more they talked, they were like the Chinese proverb. Though conversing face to face, their hearts have a thousand miles between them. Finally, Job proclaims his innocence. He says, I am innocent of great sin. And he charges God with being the cause of his afflictions. And he pleads to be able to present his case before God. Job says, teach me and I will be quiet. Show me, God, where I have been wrong. How painful are honest words, but what do your arguments prove? Do you mean to correct me what I say and treat the words of a despairing man as wind? He goes on to defend himself out of despair. I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free rein to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, don't condemn me, but tell me what charges you have against me. Does it please you, God, to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands while you smile on the schemes of the wicked? Job affirms his innocence. He charges God with treating him unfairly and he longs to present his case in court in the very throne room of God. If I could just present my case before God, he, he would acknowledge that I am innocent and then he is responsible for all that has happened to me. And this first cycle ends in despair. Job says, but as a mountain erodes and crumbles, and as a rock is moved from its place, you, o power, you overpower man once for all, and he is gone. You change his countenance and send him away. He feels but the pain of his own body and mourns only for himself. But wait, you say, is there not a glimmer of hope in this chapter? Is there not a glimmer of hope in this cycle? You may point to chapter 13, verse 15, where Job says, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. 
some of your translations may be more accurate when they translate that verse to say, he will surely slay me. I have no hope, I'll, but I will surely defend my ways to his face. But, but you know, either way, Job says that he will be vindicated by God, that his vindication will come from God. He says in verse 18 of chapter 13, now that I have prepared my case, I know that I will be vindicated. I know that my Redeemer will vindicate me. Corey Ten Boom says, There is no pit so deep, but that God is not deeper still. Does Job believe that? Stay tuned. For we all understand that there is hope in God. So what? What are the wise lessons we can glean from this cycle, these chapters? I think first of all, unlike Zoe, don't assume that you know it all. Don't make assumptions about the people you're talking to. Don't make assumptions about the people you're with. Don't make assumptions about the sinners you come across. And don't make assumptions that you know God's mind at all times. Secondly, like Ellie and Billy and Zoe, be there. Be there. Show up. Joe Bailey writes in The Last Thing We Talk About, I was sitting torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me of God's dealings, of why it happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I knew were true. I was unmoved, except I wished he'd go away. He finally did. Another came and sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask leading questions. He just sat beside me for an hour, listened when I said something, answered briefly, prayed simply, and left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. So our third lesson that I think we can take from this is don't Bible thump. When you're, when you're with a friend that is hurting, when you're with a friend that's in despair, when you're with a friend that's gone through something like Job has, don't thump your Bible. Don't walk in and say, oh yeah, but Romans 8, 28, we know that God works together for all things together for those that trust God. And, and so therefore, so therefore, just be comforted. Put on a happy face. Somebody said to me, and I, if I were Job and somebody said that to me, I'd punch him right in the mouth. Be there. Don't Bible thump. So now what? Is there good advice? Or is it all hopelessness? Are we all down three points with no timeouts? stuck on our own 20-yard line with 21 seconds left? No, there, there is hope. But there is none without God. But with God, there is hope. As Paul says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love for us Our hope is based on the love that God has for us. For God so loved all of his children that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him 
would not perish but have everlasting life. So now what? Place your hope in God. Life is not all there is. There is a life to come beyond this life. The meaning of life is not that we should grab all the gusto we can. Life is a school for the soul where we become prepared for life in eternity with God. The sufferings and testings of this life are meant to prepare us for the real life to come. Ray Stedman quotes C.S. Lewis, is picturing this reality in the closing books of the final book of the Chronicles of Narnia, a book called The Last Battle, where they say, where C.S. Lewis says, and for us readers, this is the end of all the stories, and we can most truly say that they lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story, all their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever and ever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Job didn't understand what he was going through. But chapter 14 is not the end of the story. Chapter 1 of the great story still lay ahead of Job and still lies ahead for us. Will you place your hope in God? Let's pray. Oh, Holy Father, thank you so much for these chapters. Thank you. Thank you for the lessons we learn. Thank you for the advice that you give us. Thank you for the hope that you instill us, for the hope that you instill in us through our faith and trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.